This is Brooke Drum from Printerbot.com, and I'm the CEO here, which doesn't really mean much, but uh, I'm in charge. So, good to have you. It's uh, a weekly show we do live on Facebook, Printerbot Live. It's pretty cool. And for some, it's not going to be live because they catch us afterwards, and that's cool. By the way, um, I've got these machines that I've been working on, namely uh, the CNC, by the way. Just let me lead off with some things that I mentioned last week. Uh, the Printerbot CNC is for sale as a bare bones kit. That does not include linear rails and carriages. Uh, there's other stuff that you're going to have to buy, like a router. Am I missing any big points on that one? It comes with electronics. Um, we give links to where to buy the extrusion. So I'm really trying to get the cost down for those. I just have a few. I think I put nine for sale. I have 16, but I need to order some parts to put any more up. We'll see if they sell. But anyway, $4.99. So it is a great uh, CNC. It was really, I, I had some comments online. Uh, I mentioned that I overbuilt it, and it was too much money. So I'm just selling off the parts, and we're going to take another stab at it. But uh, today, we cut with it. Um, I wonder, Dave, do you have time to go out? Y you'll need a screwdriver. Just pull the CNC cut, the, the little PB logo, off of that CNC. I'll show it to you. But uh, we got, we built two of them here, and um, just to kind of refresh ourselves with how to build these things. And they go together pretty good. Uh, I'll publish the files if they're not already published. I think they are, actually. And from that, you'll have to use that to put it together. But if you're into building machines, I think you'll really enjoy this. We use a specific router, but I checked today. I bought a DeWalt 611, uh, which is a real popular uh, router that CNC uh, people like. I mean, other companies use it. And we, uh, we uh, what was it? It was uh, not Bosch, but we ship with another model. So I'll put links to the model that the mounting plate on the about CNC is made for. But I looked today and making a bracket, uh, actually all you'll really have to do is put down the router template that comes with your router. Um, there's usually a plate that bolts on the bottom. You can just center it on the hole and drill your own holes and use the screws to, uh, s to put a different router on top of it. There's room enough for other routers. So you can choose your own router. And Henner Zeller is a guy, I uh, tweeted about it, I think he's on Google Plus, he's an employee at Google, and I gave him one of those to test. He did this really cool thing with BeagleBone Blackboard, and a uh, hat or whatever you call it that, puts, that goes on top. So he used his own electronics. Uh, Tiny G ships with it. But he has some nice little pieces that I think we've included in the product page. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so things like uh, make the handles more comfortable, um, end stop, 3D printable end stop pieces. But check out Henner Zeller on GitHub. And did we put that in the product page? OK, great. OK, He'll, uh, Dave will put a link to that. But just one really, really smart dude uh, took one of those and made it even better. So I, I just wanted to give a credit to him. And I'm going to print those parts for mine as well. But anyway, so here's what we cut today. You can see we uh, had tabs in here. This is a test piece that we cut. And so this is just MDF. It's a, what's nice about MDF is it makes toxic fumes. No, um, this, this dust is so fine you want to put on a mask. But I like it because uh, there's little to no cleanup at all. It's, you know, it's just particle. Um, so you can just sa lightly sand it, and it looks really nice. So that was cut today. I thought about doing the demo, but it is so loud, and you know it takes a while to do all the passes and everything. So instead of burn up your time, um, I could do a cut of this and, and post it. Uh, we probably have video of, of that machine doing this. I think we have video of it cutting uh, some metal and cutting um, some plastic, and now you can see it cuts wood. But wanted to mention the 599. Also, the paste extruders are still for sale, and I realize that um, some people may be hesitating. To get more details, it's fine. Just ask us what you need to know. And um, maybe even see some examples of them working. So again, uh, I'll make sure some links are up to see this machine in action and answer any questions you guys have. But it really is a great deal, so check it out. Uh, on the paste extruder, we did uh, get some wall compound. It's like a sheetrock filler. 
uh, wall compound. It's what I like to test with on those paste extruders. And I got into it uh, with one of my employees, and then I got sidetracked, so I need to post some video of that too. But uh, it's 3D printable parts. Um, we sell you the metal pieces and some custom bits that we make. And you can, if you had a CNC, you could cut the parts out of Delrin and make it all Delrin like it was originally designed. But 3D printed parts work fine. So anyway, check out the paste extruder. It's $49 if you've been interested in that. And I had a question. Uh, somebody said, do I have to reload my firmware to use the, the paste extruder that you guys are selling? Well, technically, no. But I will tell you that th there is firmware, dedicated firmware available. But we added some nice little features. For instance, we took the Z and put it at the top. So on a CNC, it's nice to like raise it up out of the way. Um, but really, here's how I start. I don't even use the end stops. So while we put end stops for the E, max and min, max and min, on the E so it wouldn't destroy itself, when you print, it doesn't take very long to print with this because it comes out of a, a tip on the end. You can cut the tip to any size you want. And you just set it up in your slicer. And when you extrude, I like to do spiral prints or, you know, you can write words in frosting or something like that. Uh, but that doesn't require, in fact, you don't want to home the, the printer before you start. You actually manually move it, or you can do it with your host interface, but I just manually move the printer where I want it to start. And I usually start that uh, paste extruder in the center, like if I had a cupcake or something. I put it in the center and then slice it that way. So I can just kind of eye it to be in the center. And then, no homing, you just say print and it'll start printing. So it's, it's really pretty basic. I wouldn't, you wouldn't need end stops at all. Therefore, you can use the stock firmware with one exception. You want to change the steps per millimeter on the Z. Because remember, this is a two gears turning a lead screw. Um, I guess, actually, it's turning the nut on the uh, to push the lead screw down. So there's a drive ratio in that um, that's very different from the, the uh, steps per millimeter that you'll have on your 3D printer Z-axis. So that's an M code. So you can go into your host uh, software and just say, uh, what is it, G92, or is that right? M90, I forget, anyway. <laughs> It's one command, an M code command, uh, M92, G92. So it's M92, and then you put in the, the values. And I don't remember if we actually posted those values, Dave. So make a note. I want to post the steps per millimeter for that um, extruder. Now, you could figure them out yourself. To calibrate Z, you really just hold the ruler up, and you change your steps per millimeter to what you think's right. And then you say, go down 10 or 50 millimeters and you measure it and then you can do some math. But anyway, so I'll post that. Uh, just remind me, Dave. And you don't have to. So you could switch back and forth between uh, your regular, um, you know, your, your, in fact, you could even bolt it on there like a little quicker mount instead of removing the extruder <laughs> from your 3D printer. You could bolt it onto the side or something and maybe a 3D printed part so that you could just have it the side and then use it together or some magnet mount or something like that. So that would be cool. Uh, you would need a motor uh, and then you'd just be plugging things in the board and switching the steps per millimeter. Enough on the paste extruder. That's really fun stuff. I don't really know how useful it is except that uh, guys that like to do clay, um, really interesting. You could do clay, 3D prints, and then bake it in a kiln. There's even some air dried uh, clay that you can get. In, uh, Native Americans have been using it for, for ages. Um, I think there's even some that's kind of like that that is intended to be baked in an oven. So clay, uh, but there's also, you know, fun stuff like frosting, chocolate, that kind of stuff. Not chocolate. You have, a melt, you have to melt chocolate. But, so those are two products. So this week um, I've been getting those ready to ship. And uh, we did get a few orders, but there's a few more available. So those are still available. But I've really dedicated my time to the printer belt and the uh, CNC. I kind of split my time. So on the printer belt, so good and bad news. Uh, the good news is it's working. Um, the bad news is it's time to move on past 3D printed parts and get some machine parts. And that takes time. So the things that I really need, I think I can just lathe here and maybe CNC here. But it's, it's going to be a little bit of a lead time. 
so I can get a little better coupling on my rollers on this. So I think it's got uh, a set screw that's skipping every once in a while. So I'm getting these really strange shapes when it, it's supposed to be a rectangle. It's kind of like a zigzag, like it'll move over a little bit. It's just not advancing that Z. So again, um, we do have it working. The software is working. I finally got squares that look like squares and, and circles that look like circles. But I need to make sure that I haven't designed something in this that is weird. <laughs> and I really need production parts to test. So we're moving on to testing the production parts in the printer belts. Now, the, I did have this guy. It's kind of torn apart because uh, we, made a, we made a terrible error and I had to cut this belt off. So I need to give this more attention. And I have actually, um, you know, I said, hey, we're going to have those kits available today. No, that was ridiculous. <laughs> am I crazy? <laughs> That's, what am I thinking? Uh, what I want to say is, you know, I get excited about projects and I get overly optimistic. And you can interpret that as stupid about deadlines and stuff. But I really want to do this right. I want it to be something that isn't, I'm, I'm thinking about instead of just a retrofit, I'm thinking about going ahead and doing the fully 3D printable printer belt um, about this size. Uh, it would look, you know, something like this, but I really want it to look like the same design. I mean, why change it? I've already figured out a, a medium and a large, so why don't I just follow up with a small and do a kit that is 3D printable, kind of like the Adoptabot style kit. Um, but then people could just order the kit from me and I could make a little bit on those parts and then you would be free to experiment with it before you wanted to put down money on a more production style machine that's made in all metal and machine parts. So I contacted uh, William uh, Bill from Polar 3D and I said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. He's like, yeah, send me one, send me one. That'd be awesome. And I said, well, it really needs to use your cloud. And he says, okay, we'll figure that out. So. Uh, because his cloud is secured um, with a serial number when he ships you know, products. So we haven't gone as far enough to figure out how to get you guys access to the Polar 3D cloud with one of these 3D printable um, printer belts. So while I'm designing, he'll get a process ready for that and then we can come together and then release, I don't know if you want to call it beta, but this, this little bitty printer belt, I don't know what I'm gonna call it, just printer belt small or something, I don't know. Uh, but I want to give you guys hands-on access to really see what it's like to use that. And you can bang on the, the cloud software too. There's also a, if you go to Thingiverse, there is a, I don't have a link for this, um, but there is the post processor that takes a slice and you know steps the layers appropriately and then tilts it appropriately. Uh, that is all open source stuff. He's published it online. It's on Thingiverse, and it might even be in GitHub, um, but I don't even know what to tell you. You can't search for printer belt because he did it as his own firmware, so I don't, I don't remember where it is. But that means that you don't have to use the cloud if you don't want to. Um, some of you might want to just tinker with it. Uh, maybe your programmers and can do a script or you know, some other clever way of doing it. Now, there are instructions as well um, to use Octoprint with I say instructions, he wrote a plug-in for Octoprint that you could also use it with. So nobody's trying to lock you down to some cloud and take your information or anything. Uh, but you got to have a printer, right? So I really feel like instead of some weird thing that's only going to work really well on one model, but it won't really work on another model, forget all that. Um, you run into that same problem like that one uh, guy was asking me, oh, I got to take it apart and then put the, the thing back on and then change the firmware. I don't want you to have to mess with that. So I think we're just going to do a simple kit that's 3D printable and I'll sell you cargo parts. So that's what I'm going to do going forward and I have no idea when it will be finished. How's that? Do you have any idea what you want it to cost? <coughs> oh. Like yeah, so it'll be, well, okay, so the Adoptabot, we're, we're either at or approaching 100, finally. I mean, we're getting close. We're at least knocking on the door of 100 Adoptabots and that was the goal. Now, that was the goal mainly because I had roughly 100 hot ends. I do have more boards. Um, but So this kit will need to be more like a legitimate kit, not me gifting stuff. It would be a product. So yeah, I'm thinking it's going to be 
definitely more than $99. But uh, you know, it wouldn't have to be much more. Like you know, I publish all the source files. If you want to get your own board, you can. If you want to use your own hot end, you can. Um, but I'll figure out a way to make it as cheap as possible. But we're talking about you know $300 range, um, something like that. So it's it'll be very tiny. It might. I think I'm going to have to reduce. You know, we have six by six already. Um, I just can't do six inches by any means. I can't do six inches because when you have that angle, you have a lot. Just the way the math works out, you actually have to travel a very long way. So it's going to be a very tiny printer, a real test printer. So maybe it'll be two hundred dollars. But I do want to. I do want to use uh, you know the cheapest parts I can and the least amount of part count. So I've already drawn several of these. <laughs> I just the way with me, and I'm going to tell you about my CNC experience. The way with me is I got to draw it a few times and build it a few times to see why that first design kind of sucks or is not any good. And then I tear it apart and do it again. 3D design is awesome. Like in this, I'll tell you, like I said, I'll tell you about this in a second. But um, it does save time, but it's not the end all be all way to prototype. You can't go from a 3D design and then ship the files off to be manufactured and expect it to work. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Um, there'll be things that you can't see, can't feel. The hardware might be slightly different. Clearances need to be fiddled with. So it just takes time. So instead of uh, releasing something that's not quite there, which I felt like I kind of did with Adoptabot, that first version did work. Um, but there were just these little tweaks that were really annoying and just one little change can really save people time and make it easier to assemble and stuff. Uh, I want to make sure I release these files after they've been vetted by me a few times and it's something that, you know, I'm proud of. All right. So any questions on any of the stuff I've talked about, Dave? Yeah, dual, I've kind of lost interest in, uh, frankly, I mean, by my actions, have you noticed? And I, I apologize. So there's a couple guys that have taken it uh, way further than I did. And that, that dual, I just come back to the reality that it is so hard to do, to spend uh, a lot of time on it and try to make a product. I mean, I did that originally. I had three extruders, two extruders. But everybody, in fact, I had a bot in my, a friend of mine came over and brought his uh, plus, he bought a Simple Pro, um, and he, he just loves the cloud and the touchscreen and all that. So he wanted to donate his plus to a hackerspace. And he says, hey, I'll pay you to make sure it's tuned up and you know running well. And so he brought it in and sat it down. And I said, you have a dual extruder? What do you? I don't even have a dual extruder anymore. And he says, yeah, I got it kind of working. He said the hard thing was the, the files, the calibration and the files. And he was really getting it to use um, dissolvable supports to do, you know, really crazy parts that you can just use supports, like, you know, gears that are already put together and meshed, that kind of stuff. And it is possible to do that. It is extremely hard to do that. So he was waiting for better material. Back in the day, it was, uh, I think, PVA. And it just is so hard to use. It, y your time is better spent. I mean, if you're looking to uh, just do supports, there may be models that only can be printed on a home printer with a dual extruder, so I'm not knocking you. But for me, I, I'd rather design something that's intended to be printed without support and figure that out instead of all the headache of a, a dual head printer. Now, that being said, will I come back to it? The guy that has got it working he actually went crazy and he put four extruders on his. So I was like, wow. Um, it's kind of a, uh, you know, there's a, it's an it's a answer waiting for a question. You know what I mean? I'm not really sure what people are going to use these for. But not to uh, rain on anybody's parade. That I have the parts for. I was waiting for uh, somebody to do it before me so I could just follow them, <laughs> honestly. So I'll, I'll take another look at it this week, but no promises. Um, thanks for asking, though. I'm glad you're into it, but you should jump in, man. You should just jump in. Oh, he, is this the guy? So you're leading me. What are you asking me for? I should be asking you. <laughs> so have you got pictures? I wonder if he has a video of the dual prints 
in progress. It is fascinating that, that, that Y brings in two filaments and just manages it through retraction. It's so cool. Um, so anyway, we should, we should chat. Uh, but well done. Uh, there's a guy that, uh, I think, is this him that posted on Twitter? Uh, yeah, posted on Twitter, so you should check out. How, does, how do people see what you've done? Does he post a link to information on it? Okay, now I'm asking you to post a link. You should contact me or Dave and give, give us some information so I can do what you did. And uh, well done. All right. I don't want to be too long today. I was too long-winded last week. Um, this is the beginning of the next version. Let me see if I can find my model here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to grab my other computer. All right, so this is going to be a little bit interactive because, man, you, you can ask my wife. I mean, I don't know how you would, but you could. She would, she would answer you. Um, I've been obsessing over this CNC stuff, um, mainly because, you know, we're saying goodbye to the Printabot CNC. And so we've used it this week, and it definitely has some strengths. Um, there are some things that I would want to change. I talked through these a little bit last week. But I went over the, uh, what is that di digital manufacturing issue that Make Magazine came out with? Cool, up, the cool issue, I mean, um, you should check it out. They reviewed one of our printers, and I, I didn't put any CNC's in there, but they had a CNC section. So I really read through those and looked at all of the various designs, and it's really clear that the guys that, you know, usually it's obvious, but sometimes not, that when you design something, you really have to have a fairly narrow set of parameters. You know, if you try to please everybody, you'll please no one. And so I do not want to make that mistake on this version. Now, this is going to be a cheap kit. Um, it's going to be, it's going to require you to have some MDF. I guess you could use plywood, but, um, you know, it's, it's like intended to be easy, I mean, cheap. So that's the first thing, cheap. Um, you know, I'm selling parts I have a bunch of, and I don't need to make a lot of money on those. Uh, so I've got the parts pulled into Fusion 360, and I've been just noodling with all these different variations of what can we do with these parts. And so I've been, uh, I just, I've designed probably five or six of these CNC machines. I'm going to show you the latest one. Uh, I've got to turn some stuff on here. Uh, when I say turn some stuff on, I mean I've got to reveal some of these things in the drawing so you can see what it looks like. Um, but anyway, so I've been trying to figure out, you know, what do people want? So here's the interactive part that I was wanting to do. Um, those of you... If there's anybody, maybe if one guy answers, <laughs> we'll know that maybe I'm wasting my time. But uh, if any of you guys want to chime in uh, to, is it called the chat room or the feed or whatever that, I'm not really up on these terminologies. Anyway, so if you want to uh, answer, here's the first question. What is the price point you're looking for for a CNC? Now, I'm not talking about like an Adoptabot CNC because I'm going to do that. It's going to be a cheap version with MDF. But um, when I design things, like, you know, the first printer I designed was 3D printed plastic, a couple laser cut pieces. The, the next ones, well, the prototype I did in acrylic. Um, the Adoptabot is plastic. Uh, what else? I did a bunch of laser cut printers. And when you use anything but metal, and especially for a CNC, when you use anything but metal, you know, with, like, the manufacturer prepares the right size holes in the right place and gives you the right hardware and it's all in a kit. Sometimes it's hard to finish these projects if you get a bunch of instructions and, you know, templates to cut out MDF or dimensions and hole templates or something. That's a lot of work. Now, maybe you enjoy that work, but if you don't make it in metal, um, there's going to be, there's some design trade-offs and it's not going to be as rigid as it could be. Um, some people argue MDF is, or, you know, plywood is enough. Uh, to do CNC routing. I would agree, uh, but I don't like the way it looks. And it does allow you, I mean, it does make you um, put in a bunch of extra parts and extra little considerations for rigidity and such. So, 
once I get this model done that you can make at home for as little money as possible, it's just going to whet your appetite. I know it's wetting mine. <laughs> what I want is something that is truly a desktop CNC that I can continue to learn and uh, play around with. But I'm going to move very quickly from cutting wood. I'm going to want to cut aluminum. And that's really my goal, is a little CNC that can cut aluminum. So first question is price point. We got any answers? Yeah, I agree. Now, for all, let me be honest with you. For all of, for anybody that's looking for a CNC, you can go on Amazon. You can go to, uh, buy something from China for uh, less than that right now. So why would you buy one from me or somebody else that's doing this? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, I'm doing it because, first of all, I don't like using other people's designs, <laughs> okay? Uh, they make different decisions. And I like... Uh, something to be aesthetically pleasing and upgradable and I'm a US company that offers support uh, here to you know you in the US so eventually I just want a good option that makes good decisions for rigidity and accuracy that you can use a router or a spindle with I've dumped the idea of a Dremel essentially uh, you could use a Dremel if you wanted to do PCB milling but that's really the only reason I use a Dremel and if you want to do PCB milling, well, you can use a smaller bit on a router or a uh, spindle that's electronically controlled. So anyway, uh, th so the first question was, so we'll land around $500. That's what, that's what we're, most people said. How big, and bigger isn't always better, how big do you want this machine to be? Is this something, like, I'll tell you what I want, and you can respond. Um, I want something that fits on a desk you know, a, a work table in my garage. I want something that I can put in the passenger seat in my car and take it somewhere, or in the trunk. Uh, I want something pretty small. So you tell me how big you want. Because the bigger you go, like, I know that Inventable sells, um, I forget what it's called, X-Carve, something like that. And there was, you know, it was like this big, and it was small, and it was kind of, I don't want to say flimsy, but that's what I'm thinking, um, because the extrusion was like really small extrusion, and you bolted a board on. Anyway, with that uh, extrusion, you couldn't get very rigid, and it was all belts. So this isn't going to be belts. This is going to be lead screw. Uh, here's a picture of where I'm at right now. I think I got some extrusion floating below there, so I'll just tuck that out of the way. So that's kind of how it's looking. Um, and you'll see the part that I have here is, can you see that at all, Dave? I should turn up the brightness. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is. A, do you need to tilt it? Okay. So uh, this stage right here, the X, is what you're looking at here. Now, I haven't uh, bolted that on because I wouldn't be able to move it. But I got to tell you, um, this is really buttery. And these are the bars and the parts I'm trying. Now, I'm a little bit embarrassed on the back because I couldn't find the right size screws, um, but I wanted to show you. So these are obviously too long, and I got some spacers even because uh, they didn't have thread all the way through. But these are just printed parts right now, and I wanted to see, well, can we get started with printed parts? Now, after I did this, um, I thought, well, I was trying to be convenient. I was trying to be uh, clever here, which that's always my problem. Um, I try to be too clever sometimes, but this uh, CNC, let me see. So the top would be here. And the main thing was I wanted to use 3D printed parts to get started, but wouldn't it be cool if once you get, the, get, get this built, and I haven't decided on this extrusion yet. I may use it, I may not. Um, it just adds cost. I, I've got it designed in here. I think I just showed you the picture. Yeah. Um, it has the extrusion in that picture, but very, very simple for me to remove that extrusion and just put a piece of MDF across the back. That's what most people do. Um, so anyway, uh, wouldn't it be cool, though, once you get this up and running with um, 3D printed parts? And this takes a long time to print, too. These are pretty big parts. But uh, there's three unique parts here, by the way, um, not including the laser cut piece that I did. But I'm thinking a drill template for a piece of MDF would work here. Um, 
So you got one, two, and three, but there's four of those. So I'll keep doing that. So once you uh, get this thing built, then you could actually use, I would think, uh, Delrin or PT, not PTFE. Is that right? I forget. The white plastic, I, I don't remember what it's called. PTFE? Uh, anyway, there's some, you know, lots of plastics that you can machine pretty easily, and they're fairly rigid. Um, better than, it would be better than printed parts. And I'm designing these parts so that they can be machined easily later. You know, ideally, you got one op, um, like, for instance, on this part, uh, one operation. And that just means uh, no tool changes, no, you know, flipping the work over or on its side because, oh, we got sawdust in there. Proof that it cut today. <laughs> I just got dust everywhere. Anyway, uh, <coughs> uh, this is one up because it used a, what was it, quarter, quarter inch, uh, uh, and what was it, what's it called, quarter inch end mill? Um, so it can drill, and then it does flat edges. So it cut all of this out with one piece. So if I design these parts that they can easily be uh, replaced by machined uh, plastic later, then you're going to have an even better machine. So you're, it's kind of like the 3D printer idea. You know, you can build a 3D printer that prints a 3D printer, and you can build that printer, and it can print another one. Um, it would be cool if you could make CNC parts in your garage. Um, now, you're not going to get away from, well, you're not going to get away from, uh, at some point, wanting metal parts. So what I'm going to do is take these flat MDF pieces that I'm doing, and I want to, what did I just do? Sorry. Raspberry Pi. Um, what I want to do is these are, what is that? Is that three quarters? I think it's three quarters. Um, something like that. Uh, I want to replace those with metal. So that means that you can get in the game very cheaply. And this will definitely be less than $500 because it's the cheap parts. But what if then you could uh, machine your own parts? Now you're even better off. It's even more rigid. And if you ever make the decision to upgrade to um, metal pieces here, it's fantastic. Yeah, you can do that. So that's what I'm thinking. A Sort of like the 3D printers that I sell, um, you, can, you could buy this uh, simple, wherever it is, you could buy this simple years ago without a heat bed, and then you could add that later. Well, that requires a bigger power supply. You can upgrade the, the hot end, the fans, um, the lead screw. You know, you know how it goes like that. So with this, uh, it's a starting point to get in the game. And if you, li if you don't like it, you haven't wasted much money. If you do like it, then continue to modify your machine. Now, I will show you this. There is a place... Well, I don't know if I want this extrusion across here, but right now I kind of, I like it, um, but I don't know. Maybe there'll be options, but I'm going to just flip this underneath here. Uh, again, I've got two extra pieces of, let me find this. Okay, disappear and disappear. Where is that? Okay. So sorry for uh, how bad is this? To s how hard is this to see through? Like impossible? Is it pretty bad? Well, what I'm showing you is that there are extrusions built into this design, and I'll show you why. When, if you have a machine that you want to upgrade, um, you don't want somebody to sell you a fixed box for the base. So I, I believe in using MDF for a spoiler board, and that can double for a little bit of rigidity, too. So right now, this is, oh, now you know my secret. I just revealed the secret. Uh, I'm testing the Tiny G with the Legacy Shield um, running this thing instead of the printer board. So I, I've mentioned this before, but I haven't got to play with it today. Uh, one of my employees got it hooked up, and I haven't played with it. But um, really, C uh, Tiny G started in CNC. And so their firmware, uh, completely out of the box, same firmware that runs our printer, can accept CNC commands. And 
you know, there's no like weirdness between, well, I'm using Marlin to do CMC. No, but you can use a real CMC uh, host software like CMCJS to run this tiny gboard. So anyway, I'm going to test it. But um, right here, I'm using the spoiler board as the structural piece to hold these bars. And these were 3D printed parts. Um, these have been redesigned, but a you know, bad idea. Why is that a bad idea? Because I want to be able to take the spoiler board off. You can see even here on my little mock-up, the angle iron uh, bolts to the top. It could bolt to the bottom, but if I took the spoiler board off to be replaced, the whole machine falls apart. <laughs> so I was uh, dealing with our uh, PrinterBot CNC, and it has, as the basic base unit, these four pieces of extrusion that come down with these very nice end plates. So that's the route I'm going to be going, um, because then you could use that uh, extrusion as, if you ever wanted to update, you could lengthen that extrusion, just buy a new extrusion and use the same end plates, and you could have more cutting area. So that's the cheapest way to upgrade a machine. If you know my printers, like on the simple, you could buy what, whatever it was, 8 or 10 inch uh, bed instead of the 6 inch bed. And it's a cheap way to upgrade. So I don't see um, CNC manufacturers, even the kits, uh, easily work with customers to upgrade their you know, base unit to something more useful. And that's what bugs me. And the really, really nice CNC machines that I see out there, they're in the $3,500 range for a desktop CNC. And I happen to think that that is ridiculous. So anyway, talked a lot about CNC today. Any questions? Oh yeah, size. What was our responses? Oh, that would be awesome. I, I hear you, man. I play guitar, sort of. Dave plays guitar. I play with a guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the beauty of this design that I, I'm really close. I'm gonna make it now. I'm I'm ready to start cutting parts. Um, for the MDF pieces. Not just laser cut parts, but like useful functional parts. And the width is with this design, uh, you could just get longer bars. I don't even think we have longer bars anymore. Remember we used to have those Super Z bars? Do we have any of those? Well, uh, this one is bars that we use. Oh, so these are, the, these are it. Yeah, we don't have longer ones, but you could start with this and if you like the design. Really all you'd have to do is have a longer section of, um, what am I trying to say, extrusion for your 18, or 18 by 24 was the biggest. You could have 24 inches of, it'd have to be longer extrusion, but slightly longer. So you could have, you know, three foot section of, or whatever it is, extrusion on the sides, and you could source some longer bars and replace this extrusion, good to go because the side pieces will work fine. So I agree, I like that size for um, a guitar, uh, to, to mill a guitar body, but it's really too big for a lot of people. A six by six, I consider to be <sighs> probably the smallest, yeah, that I would want to do. But I'll tell you that just because I have these bars, I mean, you can already tell that I've got, what, eight inch, can you grab me that ruler? Dave, you are like a helper, a cameraman, a brother-in-law, <laughs> producer. <laughs> we got to get some credits going for you. But this is already, uh, well, I should mark where the center of the bit's going to be. I don't know that I'll be able to hold this right, but we'll see. Travel right now, whoops. Travel right now is over 10 inches. Yeah, so that's usually just easier to do that. So it's about 10 inches of travel as it sits. So that is very useful. Uh, X, and it's going to be right at that, around 10. So I would say count on like 9 by 9, 8 by 8, 10 by 10, somewhere around in there. And then the Z, I've gone back and forth on this. You know, if you turn this stage up, you don't, well, I showed you in the drawing, but in the drawing, I just use this assembly to kind of situate all of my other assemblies. Um, so you do not need 10 inches of travel. The problem with 10 inches of travel is, um, the way I've designed this is the rails will be here for Z, and the rails are actually uh, moving. Is that right? No, the rails are, I forget, I forget, but 
you have to give so much clearance underneath this whole gantry if you want it to reach down all the way. And if you reach down that far, well, you're, you're going to end up too flimsy. So most people limit around four inches, and that is enough. So I'm shooting for four inches. I may experiment with six, maybe a little bit more, because I think that's what I can get out of these bars. I'm curious how it would work with, with that much, because I'd rather sell you the long bars than to, to cut them, because that sucks. Um, it's, it's hard to cut those bars. But anyway, so I would say uh, in the neighborhood of 10 by 10 by 4 is where I'm shooting, and I think that'll be plenty big enough. Um, so anyway, again, uh, no promises on delivery date, but my when my brain locks onto something, I can't let go until I like what I've made. So that's that's my promise to you. I'm going to be working on this this week, this weekend, next week, so that I can release these files and sell this kit and get some people playing with me, playing with the same equipment that I have. That's where it really starts to get valuable is when it's a shared experience. So, Well, if there's no other questions... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I do have a couple of just fun little show-off show things. Um, all right. With uh, the, the time drawing near, by the way, that I'm going to have these CNCs working and um, give Crawlbot some deserved time and the printer belt now that we're printing again. Um, I'm going to start focusing more on projects. And so uh, I just wanted to show you a couple things. One is, um, when I say projects, is I, know I've, I uh, don't show my machines printing enough and working enough. Because I'm like, yeah, it works. Sell it. <laughs> you know. And I want to I focus on, on projects uh, to show you, to stop designing 40 machines. You know? I just want to get a machine that I'm really proud of people using, and then let's do some projects and share projects together. So this one, I want to tell you about a company called Make C, M-A-K-E-S-E-A. -E -E I don't know what that means, but I talked to them on the phone for quite a while last week. And these are, this is, believe it or not, a 3D printable motor, a brushless motor, and not just any brushless motor, but it's a Hallbach array motor, which I'm fascinated with. So you can look it up on Wikipedia. So I've got um, motor wire. I've got super strong neodymium <coughs> excuse me, magnets. I have no idea what that is. Oh, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, I've actually bought this model, and I recommend you buy it too. Um, but there is a free one that's smaller. So you could build a smaller one. So if you go to, is it makec.org, Dave? Uh, can you check? .com, .org. It's probably here on the package somewhere. They're in uh, San Luis Obispo. So we're going to meet up and uh, get together. But what I like is he's got this cloud uh, platform that he's marketing to schools to manage pro projects. And there's so much detail when you buy these files, if you buy the bigger uh, motor files. Um, there is so much detail in there. You know, one thing that Thingiverse doesn't do very well is, uh, I say very well, it doesn't do it all, really. Um, you know, like GitHub does, where it tracks uh, versioning of the files. Well, this is a very complicated project done by an extremely uh, talented guy in Sweden. I wish I knew his name to give him credit, but he's on the website. Make C. M-A-K-E-S-E-A. -E -E yeah, kind of an interesting name. But um, he designed this. They commissioned him to design this motor, and what they found out was uh, it needs ongoing, I mean, a, a brushless motor, 3D printed. Um, that's crazy. Now, I've done, I, I mean, Mick, my old programmer, he actually took some plans, and we made one here, and I have a video up of that one working. But it got hot, like, instantly. This motor, there's a lot of science involved in making sure motor doesn't overheat. There's eddy currents. with. Th it's very, very complicated. But he's made it where you can 3D print this thing. Now, it, it ain't easy uh, because there's a lot of manual work involved. Um, you've got to wind 
the core yourself. Crazy. But I have been fascinated with electric motors forever, and this is a project that I'm going to embark on in all of my spare time. Uh, man, these are very strong magnets. <laughs> Holy crap. Ah! Wow. That's amazing. You can hardly get those apart. So a Hallbach array takes, ooh, wow. Man, those are, you got to check these out, Dave. These are strong. Um, anyway, so a Hallbach array, it has a can for this motor. And you insert this magnet like that with the pole and directions going one way. And then you turn it. There's a certain pattern to this. And the, the lines of flux actually kind of like push against each other and bring it forward. So you don't have to have a steel uh, or iron uh, can behind it to stop the uh, magnet lines of flux. So anyway, it becomes a very, very, very strong motor. It's called Hallbach Array. Um, H-A-L-B-A-C-H. So you can make a really small motor that's really powerful. This motor I'm printing is going to be 600 watt motor. So it'd be fun. All right. Anyway, so that's a project I'm going to do. Um, the, the heat bed in the cloud. So we've been working on that. I just received an email about it. Um, Philip, the original designer of the... Um, oh, we were offline for a while. Is that right? I don't know. It went blue and then red. We okay? All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, so Ryan is working on some improvements to the cloud, which the number one is the heat bed in uh, the cloud to be able to turn that on. It will be with your materials. So you can manage your own materials and temperatures and speeds, and then you will indicate on PLA, I want a 60-degree bed. Uh, you'll, you'll do that in the cloud. And then when you upload your materials list, your printer will know what to do. But it's cascading. There's a lot of things uh, that we need Philips help on. The original firmware uh, guy, and he did the electronics design for the printer hub. Really smart guy, great guy in Germany. Um, so yeah, they're dialed. They got a whole GitHub account thing going with questions and to-do items, and we're trading emails every day. So it's very serious. We are doing the work, spending the money to get that working. And then there's a whole bunch of other little goodies um, that are going to come with this recent activity. Uh, the overall goal really is just to make it easier to use um, in the cloud, but also open up the ability, this will take longer, open up the ability to move a file locally. So that will be cool. And the starting G code is baked into the hub right now, but we want to let go of that control and let you do whatever starting G code you like. So the tip size is the last thing. Um, change the tip size to change the bed size. And then you have a touchscreen controller that can work with our free cloud that can be used on any printer. So that's the big vision. So anyway, well, it's been good to be uh, with you this week. I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at PrinterBot and Google+. I have no idea. Something to do with PrinterBot. But I'm very active on those two channels. If you've got a question or something, you can reach out there. Or shoot me an email, brooke at printerbot.com. Take care, guys. Have a great weekend. <laughs>